Hello. Hello. So your podcast is called 99% Invisible. It's taken from a famous quote about design. Could mm. you explain what that means? It was um, a quote that I was actually um, putting together the show for the first time, and we uh, I was collected together these like landscape architects and and other uh, product designers and stuff. And we had Bruce Mao's book, yep. Massive Change. And uh, there was a, a Buckminster Fuller sort of uh, paraphrase in there that that the about the ninety nine percent invisible activity that shapes the world, and that uh, that most things are ninety nine percent of the world is invisible and untouchable. And so I was really interested in this idea that we were going to tell stories that even though these physical objects are kind of the dominant thing that we see and interact with, that the story behind them is like is the ninety nine percent invisible part of of you know this mug yeah. or whatever. So well. You came to design a bit later, though, right? You you studied genetics, is that right? Yeah. There's some design there, yeah. but not really. <laughs> yeah. So the story is you started caring about it after a boat tour in yeah. Chicago. Yeah. What, what happened there? So, I mean, in Chicago, there's great architecture. And yeah. one of the things that... One of the reasons why Chicago is so great in terms of architecture, as opposed to, like, New York, for example, I think one of the reasons why it's so great is you have this advantage to enjoy the architecture because of the river. And mm -hmm. so there's this river boat tour of architecture that I recommend everyone go on. It's life-changing, even if you don't end up starting a radio show about architecture. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I went on that once, and someone told me this, you know, this great curator told me the stories of the buildings. Mm -hmm. And I never had a lot of context for, like, why buildings were great or how I felt about them. And hearing all the stories of the buildings made me realize, you know, much later on that you could do a story. You could do a show about architecture without seeing the buildings because the stories are so rich. Hmm. And um, so, yeah, it, it's absolutely the thing that changed my life. I tell, still tell stories that was relayed to me on that boat tour. So. I think the first thing I ever appreciated about design was working at McDonald's mm -hmm. in high school. Busiest restaurant in the city. I look around and I'm like, none of us are over 17. Yeah, yeah. This is a bunch of children. Yeah, and they, they've they've constructed a system there where <laughs> you are completely interchangeable, and you were probably there for six weeks. Yeah, and you could still do the job. Yeah, and it's like it, it's it is a very well designed system in that regard. Yeah, and and you noticed immediately that you could do this over audio, even when you're talking about physical things. Yeah, I, I, you know, because fundamentally, we you know we tell stories on the radio and. You know, as long as you tell the right story and mm -hmm. don't focus on, you know, the history of architect architecture and the styles. And if you don't need to picture it perfectly, you can just tell the story of a person and how it affects you. Then um, you can do that on the radio just like you can do anything else. I mean, there's a few things that are really hard. Yeah. Graphic, graphic design is really hard on the radio. Yeah. But, um, but, if, but other than that, you can, you can usually make it work. Um, some of the stories in your podcast focus on pretty mundane things. One of the earlier episodes is about toothbrushes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what did you discover there? Well, I had met this product designer who had done uh, a, a new toothbrush. And one of the things I love about this story is that, you know, they had engaged this hand kinesthesiologist who, like, studied how people use the toothbrush and hold it and what they do with it. And... What they discovered is that there were all these sort of technical innovations that looked like technical innovations that people, they were kind of marketing employees, you know, the reach toothbrush with a sort of angled head. Yeah. That, but it, that's, that's too, like, that's good if you are using a dental instrument where someone else is using it on you, but not if you're using it on yourself. But it looks high tech. And so they discovered that, you know, the best shape for a toothbrush is completely straight and, you know, is a little bit fatter. And, um, and they had, you know, pushback because um, there are these, you know, toothbrush holders that are actually part of people's houses that are these skinny toothbrush holders. And so yeah. they were like, well, what if we had a fat handle toothbrush? What are we going to do with it? And, uh, and so I was fascinated by all the little details that went into making a decision like that, that, that I thought that was totally fascinating to me. Was there something particularly important about that one? Maybe the fact that it was so such a mundane sort of instrument? Yeah. I yeah. mean, I think that it, it was a really early episode, and yeah. it was like one that we planned, you know, well before the, the show even started. And I felt like if I can make people care about toothbrush for about four minutes, then, yeah. that's, then you can do this show. That was a good test. You've said that your philosophy is always read the plaque. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? <laughs> well, I mean, there are like stories 
everywhere. And there's lots of, uh, you know, like people with Google Glass and virtual reality, and they want an annotated layer built onto the world that yeah. explains things. Well, there is that annotated layer. It's actually <laughs> built into the physical landscape. People mm-hmm. have plaques all the time. Yeah. And uh, I was interviewing a, a friend of mine named uh, John Marr, who, who had this uh, punk zine called Murder Can Be Fun. And he okay. was a researcher. I wasn't sure where you're going there with John <laughs> no, Marr it wasn't, punk. It wasn't okay. from the Smiths. Yeah. But he, he, uh, he had this, uh, he was at a, a zine symposium uh, on research-based zines. He was talking about how he does all of his research to do his show. He does stories about um, murder and crime and stuff like that. And uh, it was at the Portland State University campus. And he was giving the talk in the Michael J. Smith Student Union. And he was talking about like how he's curious about the world and how it sort of starts all of his process. And he's like, oh, by the way, you know, this is the Michael J. Smith Student Union. Do you guys know who Michael J. Smith is? And they're like, no. He's like, well, in 1965, he was the president of the College Bowl trivia team. And they, and PSU beat the odds and beat all these Ivy League schools and became the trivia champions of the country. And, but he had cystic fibrosis and he died three years later and they named it after the student union after him. And I'm like, well, how did you know that? He's like, well, there's a plaque right outside the door. I just read the plaque as I came in. <laughs> and, and he's like, always read the plaque. And it's become kind of this mantra hmm. because there's so many stories. I mean, a lot of the stories are wrong, you know, like in plaques. Yeah. And they're often, you know, written by the wrong people. <laughs> and uh, they're simplistic, but they get you started in a process. And so um, I make it an effort to always read plaques. It's about being observant, I yeah. guess. yeah. And noticing that there's a story behind things and yeah. that there's always uh, a lot of history to get to this point. And, and I like that stuff. I'm talking with uh, Roman Mars, the host of the 99% Invisible podcast. I'm so careful not to say Bruno Mars. It's insane. <laughs> <laughs> it's That's been okay. my day mayor for the last <laughs> 24 hours. Um, I understand you said um, that you understand design because so much about it, about it is, is about logic. Mm-hmm. What do you mean by that? Oh, I mean, if design is working... Yeah. It's because it's logical. And so uh, so it doesn't take necessarily a designer to cover design. I mean, it takes a designer to do it. Mm-hmm. But, um, but for the most part, you just look for the things that make sense. And, and rarely does good design not make sense. That's the whole idea of it, is that it just works. I and mean, that's another reason why you can cover it uh, in an interesting way, uh, that's, that, that I, like, I like to cover good design, which is, which is often the thing that gets ignored. It's, it's pretty easy to talk about the failures and yeah. you notice the failures. You notice, you know, the light switch in your house that you've had for 20 years, like you've lived in this house for 20 years and you still don't know which, you know, switch goes to which socket in your yeah. house. Like that, you run into that all the time. And, and, and the good design tends to, you, it totally escapes your attention. Yeah. And so I like calling attention to, to both of those things, the, the logical parts. I always notice, um, the debit machines and credit card machines, they never they don't all swipe uniformly yeah. the same direction. It throws you off. It throws you off. Yeah. Yeah. It's totally true. <laughs> I can't I have to uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts and anytime I use an ATM machine or or have to check out in an automated way, yeah. I have to turn everything off because I can't <laughs> do it at the same time, which is kind of a bad sign. Yeah. <laughs> so. so there's a logical side to design, there's also an emotional side. Mm-hmm. People consciously design products to make us want to buy them, like you said, with the high-tech looking mm-hmm. toothbrushes. Mm-hmm. Right. Why do you think we get so emotionally invested in inanimate objects like our phones? Well, I, you know, I think we just have this, I, I don't, I think it's not, it's more surprising that we wouldn't be, to tell you the truth. Mm. I mean, we just, you know, when you touch and feel things and there is some kind of story behind them and there is some kind of um, way that you interact with them. I don't think it's surprising that you have an emotional attachment to these mm-hmm. things. Um, we tend to attach narratives and personality to almost anything we possibly can. We see faces in things. We see, you know, like big eyes and and emotional c- content in things that are not there at <laughs> all. And so um, it does not surprise me. Yeah. And sometimes we abs- we ascribe design problems to things that have nothing to do with designs. For example, cul-de-sacs right. that you examined. What did you discover there in that episode? Well, I mean, cul-de-sacs are, they're, they're solving a design problem for a certain set of people, which mm-hmm. is um, parents who want their kids to like play in the street. And so um, they are 
sort of perfect for that reason. They're terrible for almost every other reason. <laughs> they're bad for cities and city planning. They're they're inefficient to like pick up trash. They're and and they're in terms of a city planner, yeah. um, they're considered like one of the worst things ever. And they and certain cities have completely banned them from new developments. But what I like to 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 do when I examine those stories is to talk about all those reasons why they're terrible, but also recognize that people aren't idiots. They live on them for a reason. Yeah. And they live on them because that's the lifestyle, you know, they want. And and other sorts of really fast grid streets and downtowns are not their thing. Yeah. And so I like to sort of make sure that everyone knows that there's there's actually design behind other things, but there's just different agendas of what the design is for. And so that's what I discovered about. I usually am pretty forgiving when I <laughs> when I analyze these things. There are people that think you can save the world through design. Yeah. And design, I've noticed, has become, we, we talk about it in broader terms, mm. um, not just in terms of art, but in terms of problem solving. Yeah. What do you, how do you feel about that idea? I mean, fundamentally, design is problem solving. Yeah. And so in that case, it's true. You will save the world through design. I do think that there is a kind of um, pathological optimism and solutionism that you can sort of get trapped into when you think, um, we don't need to deal with this. Design will save us eventually. Kind of like some, mm. sometimes like the market will save us eventually if you're of a sort of different bent. There's a, there's a way that if – there's certain things that I don't think um, – there's some design solutions um, that aren't really there necessarily like if, when it comes to like poverty or something. Sometimes you just have to throw money at things and it's not about um, finding this app that's going to make it better. Yeah. And so I think you can get caught into a trap where you think that design is going to save you, and it's probably a mistake. Why do you think design is sort of raised in our consciousness now? It, it's just a, it's a more common conversation. I know, it is. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I definitely am grateful for it because yeah. <laughs> that's why my show exists. Yeah. But I noticed it a, a few years ago when, you know, people would just, online people argue about fonts. This is something that I was totally <laughs> new to me. Yeah. And... I don't know what that is from. I think it's a little bit having to do with the internet and people finding a community of to argue about things. I think that we interact with more things in complex ways and we recognize that um, we could have things better. I also think that um, Apple has made people conscious, conscious of good design yeah. in a way that is, is pretty unusual. We didn't really care about the design of our phones yeah. before. Um, sometimes they were neat and, and looked a little bit better. But for the most part, this wasn't really something we engaged in. The Western Electric 302, the sort of office phone that was existed for like 60 or 70 years, yeah. was the phone that existed on people's desk. And nobody thought, was this a well-designed object at all, even mm. though it totally was. And it's yeah. a testament for why it was there for so long. So um, it just kind of clicked in. And I think if, once you start having these conversations, you realize that people do care. Once they notice it, they do care. And that's a pretty fun thing to tap into. Do you think part of it is that sort of darker idea that you mentioned about people's faith moving from the market to design? Maybe. Yeah. But, that's really interesting. But I also think that, I, I also just think that people enjoy it I, it, hmm. in, in a way that, there's a way, because it solves a certain problem and everyone likes to solve problems, they can imagine a better way to do it. And I don't know. I think that it, it's kind of seductive to begin thinking about the world. Like, I, I, I know I have changed since I started the show. Like, I notice the world. I notice things more acutely than I did before. And, and I think that once you get into that and you start reading the plaques and you start noticing that somebody made a decision about every little tiny thing in the built world. Yeah. It's, um, it's fun. The world is fun that way. You've said that this podcast has made you more optimistic. Is that what you mean? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Because these are all like, these, all these little decisions, smart people have been working to make our lives better. Mm -hmm. And when you notice that, uh, it's a comforting feeling. It, I don't think you should take too much comfort into it. You know, you should definitely still like live your life well. Yeah. <laughs> and like not everyone's going to save you from yourself and your bad decisions, but it, it's a nice feeling to know that it's smart nice people to know. are yeah. working on your behalf. That's true. Why don't you think mo more people notice these things? Do we take it for granted? Yeah. I mean, I think your your mind is wired to shut things out 
that are not required because yeah. you have so many more important things to take 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 on. Yeah. And so that's you know, that's perfectly rational. And we live in a world where we don't understand how most of it works. Right. <laughs> I think is <laughs> on purpose. I mean it's totally fine. Yeah. You know, we there's the stratification of knowledge and people know more things than you do. And that's totally fine. And but I I you know, I'm amazed by Every, I mean, just like the postal service. Every once in a while, I'm just like amazed that well, how does the postal service function? Yeah, you know, yeah. like what, you wouldn't even start that today. It's so absurd. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, I love stuff like that. Like th th these weird design solutions that are seem foolhardy, but smart people have worked on it, made it better, made it my life better. Have you always been observant in, in this way, or has thinking from a design perspective really changed that for you? It's. I think it's more heightened. Yeah. I've always been a. I was always really into science. I loved the way the stories of how the world was made and explained. Yeah. I just sort of switched focus from sort of the natural world to the built world at a certain point, um, which is, you know, which has been fun. Thanks, Roman. Thank you.